on one unsuspecting day. In Houston, Texas, two women, both named Mary, are killed in very similar ways. Could it be a bizarre coincidence? Or is something darker afoot? Theories abound, so let's dive deep into this mystery. What you are about to hear is believed to be real. Based on witness accounts, testimonies, and public record, this is Terrifying and True. A haunting story that would confound authorities and captivate true crime fans for years unfolded against the spooky background of Houston, Texas in the middle of October 2000. This is the story of the Mary Morris murders, a series of events so peculiar and frightful that it's hard to believe they're not the product of a dark, twisted novel. But alas, every detail is true and it remains one of the most fascinating and mysterious double homicides in American history. This story is not an April Fool's joke, even if we're publishing it on April Fool's Day. So get comfortable and make sure you're subscribed as we dive into the Mary Morris murders right after these quick words. A day like any other transformed into a chilling mystery in the heart of Houston, Texas. Mary Lou Morris, 48, a beloved loan officer at Chase Bank, was the epitome of kindness and warmth. Her life intertwined deeply with her husband Jay's and was a beacon of happiness in the rushing stream of everyday existence. Their routine morning goodbye, exchanged on October 12, 2000, was filled with the usual affection, yet fate had a grim twist in store. As hours ticked by, the silence from Mary Lou's end grew profoundly unsettling. Known for her prompt replies and warm conversations, her absence from the other end of the line became a growing concern for Jay. His attempts to reach out to her were met only with the void, a silent echo chamber. With dusk painting Houston in shades of worries and whispers, Jay's uneasy gut feeling turned into alarm. His call to her boss brought a revelation that turned his fear into a stark reality. Mary Lou hadn't made it to work that day, and no one knew her whereabouts. Faced with the unnerving truth and a heart heavy with apprehension, Jay reported Mary Lou missing. Little could anyone have imagined that this was just the beginning of an enigma destined to haunt Houston's memory, turning an ordinary day into a perplexing mystery that would echo through time. Just as Jay's conversation with the police was unfolding, a chilling event was taking place uncomfortably close to their home. A bystander, nondescript and merely engrossed in his usual highway drive, stumbled upon a disconcerting sight. There, quietly tucked by the side of the road, was a car, ominously emitting smoke, a mere stone's throw away from the cozy abode that Mary Lou and Jay had shared, less than three miles away, to be exact. In an uncanny coincidence, that very same morning another observant individual had reported a puff of smoke in the exact same area. The fire department, thinking it was simply some controlled burn, a heap of leaves or scrap being incinerated by a homeowner, perhaps, chose not to investigate. The scene that greeted the policeman was a grim tableau of horror. There, in the charred remains of the car, in the driver's seat, was what used to be a human form. So severely burned and drenched in gasoline that it was impossible to identify the person. Amidst the shocking scene, a lone tooth was discovered. Upon examination, it confirmed the form to be that of Mary Lou. 
Sadly, the extent of damage by the fire obliterated any trace of what might have caused her untimely demise. Despite the hellish scene, there were items of value that remained untouched within the car. Oddly enough, only two objects appeared to be missing. Mary Lou's everyday companion, her purse, and something of sentimental value, her wedding ring. Mary Lou's tragic end sent shockwaves through the hearts of everyone who had the privilege of her acquaintance. She was, in their hearts, the most kind person they knew, someone who showered generosity like every day was a celebration. Unable to comprehend this horrifying twist of fate, they were left questioning, why would anyone intend to harm such a kind-hearted soul? The thought was inconceivably puzzling. Just when the city of Houston thought it was reeling from a mystery it couldn't unravel, a single phone call to the Houston Chronicle added an eerie twist to the tale of Mary Lou's tragic ending. The voice on the other end of the line dropped a chilling comment, claiming the papers had mixed up the story of Mary Morris. This cryptic message left more questions than answers swirling in a cloud of confusion until another name surfaced, deepening the mystery that much more. Three days after that unsettling call, the focus shifted to Mary McGinnis Morris, a 39-year-old who shared more than just a city and a last name with Mary Lou. Mary McGinnis was carving out her path in life, thriving in her career as a nurse practitioner and holding a significant position in a major industrial corporation's health clinics. With her husband Mike by her side and a daughter who completed their family, her life in Houston seemed to paint the picture of success and fulfillment. Mary McGinnis was known for her warm, approachable demeanor. She had a knack for making connections with her colleagues, effortlessly weaving friendships at her workplace. Despite the harmony, there was a note of discord, one individual with whom she did not see eye to eye. The juxtaposition of these two Marys, their sudden tragic ends, and the cryptic phone call wrap up into a haunting tale of coincidence and confusion, marking a chapter in Houston's history that both captivates and confounds to this very day. In the days leading up to the unimaginable tragedy, Mary McGinnis Morris, a dedicated nurse practitioner, found herself engulfed in an unsettling situation at her workplace. Among her new team members, Dwayne Young stood out, not for his skills or dedication, but for the unease he sparked in Mary. Her instincts screamed caution. Something about Dwayne didn't sit right with her a feeling so intense that she confided in her close friend, Lori Gemmel, about her fears. Mary was convinced that Duane wasn't just a source of discomfort, but a potential threat to her safety. The tension escalated when Mary discovered her workplace violated. Her personal belongings disarrayed, her pictures turned away as if to erase her presence, and a chilling note that read, Death to her. It was more than an unsettling prank. It was a declaration of malice, and Mary was certain Duane was behind it. This incident pushed her to a decision driven by fear for her life. She asked her husband, Mike, to teach her how to use a gun, a weapon she intended to keep in her car for personal protection. Complying with her request, Mike placed a gun, legally purchased in his name, under the driver's seat of her car, hoping it would never need to be used. On the ill-fated day of October 16th, 2000, Lori visited Mary at her clinic for a routine flu shot, unaware it would be the last time she'd see her friend in a setting of normalcy. Mary shared her plans for the day with Lori, finishing work, running errands, and then heading home to prepare dinner, a simple narrative for an ordinary day. However, later at a drugstore, an unnerved Mary phoned Lori, her voice tinged with panic. She mentioned feeling watched and harassed by the presence of someone lurking nearby. 
Deciding against lingering, she aimed to quickly return to her office, shut down her computer, and rush to the safety of her home. But Mary never made it home. Just 12 minutes after their conversation, a horrifying emergency call was placed to the police, a call so profoundly disturbing that its contents were sealed away from the public, capturing the desperate final moments of Mary McGinnis as she was viciously attacked. Mary's life came to a tragic end in her own car, a scene gruesomely staged to mimic a suicide. Found beaten and with a fatal gunshot wound to her head, the grim reality suggested a different tale. The weapon, previously hidden for protection under the driver's seat, was now conspicuously placed on the passenger seat next to her, implicating its use in the final act. It was confirmed as the gun Mike had given her for safety, turned into an instrument of her demise. The rumor mill points to an error made by a hitman who was supposedly hired to kill one, but ended up killing them both. Mary Lou, a woman with no known conflicts, fell victim first. Then Mary McGinnis, going through a troubled marriage with her husband Mike, was murdered. Mike was at a movie with their daughter when his wife was killed. However, his refusal to take a polygraph test and the fact that he stood to gain $700,000 from her life insurance did raise eyebrows. It is important to mention that polygraph tests are often inconsistent, inaccurate, and most importantly, inadmissible in court. Suspicion grew when Mike made a four-minute call to his wife post her panic call to the police. He claimed the call went unanswered. Also, Mary McGinnis's missing wedding ring found on Mike's daughter's finger further supported the hitman theory. Dwayne Young, Mary McGinnis's former co-worker who left his job in the midst of these happenings, is also a person of interest in the case. Though he denies any involvement, whispers of his possible role in the tragic end of the two Marys continued. Half a year had gone by since the dark cloud of the murders had settled over Houston when an unexpected twist stumbled into the life of Jay, Mary Lou's grieving husband. Amid the mourning and chaos, a phone bill arrived. An astonishing charge of $2,000 linked to Mary Lou's phone card. This clue set the wheels of the investigation in motion, leading the police to a 16-year-old girl in Galveston, Texas. This teenager shared a curious story. The phone card was a gift from her neighbor. The authorities pressing this neighbor for answers uncovered another layer of the mystery. She claimed to have stumbled upon a purse in a store's parking lot weeks earlier. Inside, various items and the contentious phone card lay tucked amidst the belongings. Yet, when this purse was shown to Mary Lou's family... They met it with puzzled stares, unable to recognize it as hers. But the peculiar events didn't halt at the doorstep of the mysterious phone card. Jay's phone rang three times, each call wrapping him tighter in the enigma. On the line was a voice inquiring about Mary Lou. With a heavy heart and steadied voice, Jay directed the caller toward the Harris County Sheriff's Department. The caller's brief response, oh yeah, right, preceded the abrupt end of the call. Despite efforts, the police's attempts to trace the mysterious caller hit a dead end, leaving more questions than answers in their wake. The police believe the two sad incidents where both women named Mary Morris died are not linked. But if that's true, then the mystery of who harmed Mary Lou is a question still waiting for an answer. If these stories are indeed twisted together in fate, then all eyes rest on two men, Mike Morris and Dwayne Young. Mike, who was married to one of the women, and Dwayne, who worked with her, are like two key pieces of a puzzle in a much bigger picture, muddied by doubt and half-clues. Their connections to Mary McGinnis' life have put them in the spotlight the kind that casts long, dark shadows. These shadows stretch far, covering the truth in darkness. 
even though the police haven't crossed out Mike or Dwayne's names from their list of people they're looking at, they haven't found enough evidence to bring everything to light. The memory of what happened stays tucked away, with no solid answers to tell us how or why Mary Lou and Mary McGinnis's lives ended so tragically. The simple truth that lies at the heart of it all, the unanswered questions about the fates of these two women named Mary hangs heavy, and unfortunately, there's no end to the mystery in sight. Terrifying and True is narrated by Enrique Couto. It's executive produced by Rob Fields and Mark Shields. Produced by Daniel Wilder with original theme music by Ray Mattis. If you have a story you'd like us to cover on the program, send us an email at weeklyspooky at gmail.com. And if you want to support us in a very direct way, go to weeklyspooky.com and click on Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, you can support us and allow us to keep the spooky rolling and rolling and rolling. And I want to say a big thank you to our Patreon podcast boosters, folks who pay just a little bit more to hear their names at the end of the show. And they are Johnny Nix, John Kalen, Bobbletopia.com, Jenny Green, Brent McCullough, Karen Wiemet, Jack Kerr, and Craig Cohen. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you next time right here on Weekly Spooky and Terrifying and True. <laughs>